Browsing My Bookcase, part one. I had intended at the start of this lockdown to reorganise my books and the shelves in the study. Good intentions sometimes go awry. But one intention that I did have that didn't go awry was looking at the Psalms during Lent. And as I looked at my bookcase, I don't know about you, but I'm fascinated by other people's bookcases and what the books they've got in it. I realised that I have far more commentaries and books on the Psalms than I have on any other book of the Bible. So, for example, I've um, about six or seven uh, commentaries on Mark, possibly slightly less on Matthew, around the same on Luke and, and John, but I've eight commentaries on the Psalms, plus three, four more books written about the Psalms. And one of the um, my favourite authors, my favourite theologians, Old Testament theologians, is Walter Brueggemann. And he has written some fantastic commentaries on the Psalms. I suppose it is all because all human life is there. And I was very much taken with someone who once said to me, when the well is dry, when you're in the depths of depression, go to the Psalms. The psalmist cries out to God. And it, some of the Psalms are not an easy read at all, as we've been discovering as we've gone through the evening Psalms at nine o'clock on Facebook. I've been tempted occasionally to leave some out, but we've ploughed on and we need to plough on. The other um, quote that I like, I think Walter Brueggemann gave in a TED talk, was this, you can do a number of things with anger. You can take it out on other people, shout and be uh, violent and be abusive, and that way leads to destruction, leads to abuse, uh, leads to violence. You can turn it in on yourself, that way leads to loss of self-esteem, to self-loathing, to depression, and violence against yourself. Or you can do what the psalmist does and turn it over to God. You can rage and shout at God. Our God is big enough to absorb this rage. And the psalmist does just that at times. Most of the Psalms actually then turn around and go, and yet, and yet I will trust because I can do no other. Yet I will turn to you. The author that I want to turn to, though, today is not Walter Brueggemann, interesting though he is, but rather Jim Cotter. I first came across Jim Cotter's um, books in a little church at the end of uh, the Finn Peninsula in Aberdavon, um, where Jim lived out his retirement uh, as the priest there at St. Hewens. And I apologise for my anybody who's listening from Wales for my uh, pronunciation of Welsh names and name places. Jim was a um, Anglican priest. He uh, he also um, started off near Watford, I believe. He was a lecturer, a broadcaster. He led retreats, but he was above all a wordsmith. And he has written three versions of the Psalms called By Stony Places, that's number two. 
through desert places, by stony paths and towards the city. He'd also written a number of other books, um, one which I found particularly affecting is called Brain School, Soundings from a Deep Depression. And a thread that runs through Jim's retelling of the Psalms is, this is grounded in uh, his own experience of depression and latterly uh, he his battle with cancer, with leukaemia, which he died from a few years back. He's buried at a little church uh, which he ministered to along with St. Huron's and Ab just about a mile and a half uh, further on from Abadaran, um, which looks out over the sound to Bardsey Island. But I wanted to read to you, if I may, some of his introduction to By Stony Paths. Jim writes, like the psalmists, we have experiences which shake faith's foundations, making it seem impossible to believe in God. The psalm itself is often a temporary resting place in a process of prayer, in which little by little these lumps of experiences are chewed and digested, and begin to be transformed into a living body of words, reaching to the depths of the imagination and to the flesh to renew and inspire. The psalmists faced disasters of defeat and exile which overtook their people, and they asked the question, has God broken those promises made in solemn co covenant? Will God come quickly and raise up the downtrodden? And the constant question, why do the wicked prosper? When we're trying to come to terms with a particularly intractable bit of experience, there'll come a moment when words are no longer of use to us, when prayer seems empty and God seems absent and silent. At such times, the words of the Psalms may point to that stage and enable us to endure it. Perhaps we have to hold in tension this sense of a God as absent or a vast emptiness and the increasing demand upon us that we no longer use God as a childish prop but to grow into the godliness of the psalmist's prayer. Faith cannot bypass the 20th century's hells on earth. Even if belief in hell as a place beneath the earth has declined. Just as God is no longer imagined as simply over there, so hell is much nearer home. And Jim takes three people from the 20th century to illustrate this task. He takes Primo Levi in relation to Auschwitz, Margaret Spufford in relation to genetic disease and R.S. Thomas in relation to nuclear power. Primo Levi, an Italian chemist, was imprisoned by the Nazis in Auschwitz. Under the pressure of that awful place, he found his Jewish faith disintegrating. He survived the camp because he had useful skills as a chemist, but he still had to endure the periodic assembly before a commission which decided whether a person was still fit for work or should be assigned to the gas chamber. On one particular occasion he was in anguish and tempted to cry out in prayer for help, but he felt to do so would have been a kind of reverse blasphemy for an unbeliever. He rejected the temptation to call upon a supernatural being to intervene on his behalf. He comments that he would have felt ashamed. Later, an autobiographer said he kept faith with his faithlessness. There's an austere integrity here, a truthfulness and clarity which enabled Levy to write of the Holocaust not exactly with compassion and certainly not with forgiveness, but without hatred. He has refused to add to its pain. Such a refusal, held for over 40 years, might be seen as a kind of spiritual commitment. 
Unlike Primo Levi, Margaret Spufford has held on to faith, but the process of coping with pain and the steady refusal to accept cheap consolation is remarkably similar to the attitude of the Italian. She's written about it in Celebration, the font book of 1989. She suffered from osteoporosis and was an alive and alert woman in a cro cl slowly crumbling skeleton. Her daughter Bridget was born with a rare genetically caused metabolic disease. And at one period, Bridget was surrounded by children on a ward in Great Ormond Street Hospital, all of whom were dying from diseases caused by genetic malfunction. Spuffer called this none other than genetic evil, a malfunctioning from the moment of conception. She had to face the reality of small children who'd been made wrong. It was as if the hand of the Creator, visualised as the potter, had slipped. All of this tremendous bulk of pain in Margaret Spuffer's life, she could not even perceive how it could be transformed by love. By love, it remained an intractable evil. She has found some help from the theologian W. H. Vanstone. For him, the omnipotence of God is not total control, but a love that is able to bear whatever pain is heaped upon it and to redress what has grown amiss, even at the microscopic level of genetic failure. For Margaret Spufford to believe that is to have a faith finely wrought indeed, only just held on to and as fragile as her bones. The third person is R.S. Thomas, a priest and a poet who lived in Wales and was the vicar at Aberdarn before, well before Jim Cotter. In fact, his first wife, Ellie's grave was um, a few yards from Jim Cotter's grave in the little church. R.S. Thomas's own grave is at Port Maddoch uh, and he lived amongst the hill farmers and watched nuclear power stations grow in beautiful places. He referred to himself as the composer of the first radioactive verses. And to investigate the horror of nuclear power, uh, nuclear bombs, is to face horror, not as a contemplation of evil and act upon it, it's as a bearing within, R.S. commented, a slow digesting, detail by detail. So the Psalms present us with ascetic work to be done. At times they may encourage us, but they do not flinch from awfulness and are not willing to let God get away with anything less than making all things come right. So in facing the realities of genocidal murder, of genetic malfunctioning and of nuclear destruction, all new twists and pain in the 20th century, we may occasionally glimpse fruits of understanding, Jim Cotter writes, but not always and never without cost. It would be easy to plunge with a dramatic leaf of faith or a dive of despair. It's much harder to go step by step down a rock face. In a poem called Groping, R.S. Thomas imagines a dark cliff he is descending. He hears the voice of others also climbing down. There are hands to take which help. Some footholds and handholds have been used before. He discovers a faint light surrounding the bones of those who have gone this way before, pioneers who died for the truth. Step by step then. And who can say when faith might crack and crumble for any one of us? There may come a moment when we may not be able to do anything other than plunge over the waterfall, whose roar Margaret Spufford heard and dreaded. When we've done all we can, step by step down the rock face, we may be so exhausted that all we can do is will a fall. Faith may just give us the marginal hope that in the last moment of total letting go, 
if the fall is into a bottomless pit, we may find ourselves in a new world where gravity no longer exercises its pull. We do know from time to time small moments of transformation which we cannot compel, yet we can in some way work towards. Moments which always surprise us because they place some fear, some limitation, some problem into a wider context. Perhaps there lies ahead a totally unexpected transformation into a new dimension. Jim Cotter ends the introduction with these words. Perhaps the spirit will no longer be imagined as a dove, but as an eagle or an albatross seizing us and teaching us how to fly.